thankful to you for sticking around for this last session of this day, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to uh, present just a few practical ideas on how to get your name uh, into the community. Uh, as Ronnie said, or made mention of the door knocking, I'm sure that some of you are aware of the effort that's ongoing in Walker County, even right now, uh, called Operation Reconcile. And they are uh, knocking every door in Walker County. Um, I just finished a meeting Thursday. I had a five-day meeting in uh, Carbon Hill this week, and uh, they had a tremendous amount of success with their door knocking campaign there in Carbon Hill and in a uh, little town community, Kansas, uh, that's near there. Uh, they've had two baptisms as a result of that door knocking campaign. A number of uh, in-home Bible studies have been set up. Uh, correspondence courses have been set up. Prayer requests have been taken. And uh, that is, uh, that is uh, still uh, an effective way to get your name into the community. I couldn't help but laugh, at least to myself, when Ronnie was talking about people not knowing where the building is or not knowing where the church is. Uh, some years ago, uh, I was in a meeting, and I won't tell where it was, but it was in a, a, a city, an urban area, a place that I had been on a number of occasions but hadn't been in a long time, and the roads tend to change and the exits and whatnot. And, and I thought I was on the right road, and it turned out that I was, but I just wasn't sure. And so I stopped at a convenience store to make sure that I was on my way, uh, on the right road, going to the right place. And I stopped, and not one person who worked there or was in that building knew where the church was that I was inquiring about. And I was a quarter of a mile away. I was on the right road, a quarter of a mile away. The church building was simply through a stop sign on the other side of the hill. And not one person in that building knew where it was. And, and fortunately, I was on the right path. This is back before GPS and all that, you know, when your phone could tell you where you needed to go. But, uh, but when he made mention of that, it struck me that that, that was a, a sad. Of course, again, it's an urban area. There's literally tens of thousands of people who live there. And so, you know, and I don't even know that anybody there was lived or, you know, close to that place. But it struck me that not one person knew where the building was and we were less than a quarter of a mile away. But the Operation Reconcile is a, is a great effort, uh, and it reminds me also that uh, for a number of years uh, in, um, in the com larger communities close to uh, what we call our little Bible Bowl area, you know, our congregations collect, you know, Ronnie will tell you, you know, in our area in Marion County, you know, there's Marion County, and we, you know, and we uh, fellowship the people in uh, Winston County, but not beyond Double Springs. And, uh, and Walker County, but not beyond Jasper, and, uh, and uh, 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 Fayette County, but not beyond Fayette, and then, uh, and then Lamar County, but not beyond Vernon. And, and, and Fayette, uh, Franklin County, forget it. We, you know, we, don't, we don't fellowship those folks. Or, or just across the you know, across state line over in the Itawama County, well, we don't fellowship those folks either. But the, my point is, is that there's so many of us that it's impossible to support everybody because of the nature uh, of, of where we live and, and the strength of the church. But every year we knock doors in all the major towns. Every year the youth ministers organize that. And we knocked every door uh, in Hamilton one year. All, everybody from all the congregations gathered together. And one year we knocked at Hamilton. And one year we knocked in Winfield. And then we knocked in Double Springs. And then we knocked in Vernon. And we rotated in, in that circle. And we knocked all the doors at least twice over the course of about uh, eight years. And that was a very effective uh, a tool. And, of course, got our young people involved. And we even had folks come from out of state uh, and, and did that. So that's, a, a good, that's still a good way to get your name uh, into the community. Um, I have a, just a few things, general areas that, are written, that I have written down. Uh, the first, say, four primarily for preachers. Uh, things that have been helpful to me, and I know that Ronnie has used these as well. Uh, you know, the first thing I thought of is house to house, heart to heart. I don't know anything that gets the name of a congregation into a community any more effectively than house to house, heart to heart. Uh, the Burleson Church, uh, where I preach, uh, we're just a small congregation, 
uh, about 55 or 60 members, and we mail uh, over 6,000 copies every time out. Every single Hamilton, uh, every single Hamilton household receives house to house heart to heart. There are eight mail routes. We cover those eight mail routes. And as Ronnie will tell you, we live in the middle of nowhere, or almost, or the middle of everywhere. I don't know if it's the middle of nowhere or the middle of everywhere, because within about a mile of where, where Ronnie and I have both lived, you've got Hamilton, Bear Creek, Gewin, and Hackleburg, and Brilliant addresses all within one mile of one another. And so we, we handle all, the, all eight Hamilton uh, uh, mail routes, and that goes even 20 miles on the other side of Hamilton, all the way down to Detroit and, and, and that part, of the, you know, nearly to the state of Mississippi. And we handle the Bear Creek route because it comes close to us. In fact, Barn Creek Church, I believe, was a Bear Creek address. And we handle the Hackleburg route that comes out our way. There are two routes there. We used to handle, and we still handle the Hayleville route too, which comes within a mile of the building. And we used to do brilliant, but the church there decided they wanted to take it up, and we thought it would be better for them to do their work there, and so we let them uh, have that route. But uh, House to House, Heart to Heart has been a very effective tool for us uh, in getting our name into the community, and now people have just learned to expect it. We've been mailing House to House for 15 or 16 years now, we're, well, I, you know, the, there's a number on those that are participants in House to House, and we were congregation number 36, so we've been in for a long, long time, because now there are well over a thousand congregations that use it, uh, so we've been in for a long, long time, and people just expect it, and they still appreciate it, and, uh, and for the local preacher, I would suggest if you use House to House Heart to Heart, write your own back page article. You can do a left-hand side article with about 250 words. You can do both columns uh, as one article with about 550 to 600 words, or you can write two brief articles. Uh, but uh, I always uh, do my best to write our own back page article. Been doing it for over 15 years. Uh, you can write on local uh, uh, matters of local uh, uh, importance. Uh, and of course, you can advertise your meetings and, 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 and speak to local issues. And so that's been very, very effective for us. And so that's one thing that I would mention. Also, uh, at Burleson, we have a television program. And it is a live Bible questions and answers program every Thursday night. Now, Hamilton's a little bit different than a lot of small towns in that at one time we had three TV stations in Hamilton. Three. And the town only has 5,500 people in it. But uh, television is a very inexpensive way for us because it costs us $40 a week for a half hour program. And they show it about eight or nine times a week. I mean, the, our contract, so-called contract, our verbal agreement is, is that, first of all, it's live every Thursday night, and then they're going to show it one more time at, during the week, but they use our program all the time as filler. And so, and so we're very blessed to get a number of showings every single, every single week. And so that's been, a, that's been a great tool for us. And I realize that, that local cable access can be expensive in a lot of places, and it may not be feasible to do that, uh, but I, I, I suggest, if you can, to get some type of uh, television program, and my personal opinion is that your own program is more effective than simply airing your worship services. Now, some congregations do that. When I was in Paris, Tennessee, we aired our worship services one week delayed. Uh, we were live on the radio for an hour during the worship assembly, and then that same assembly was shown on television the following, the following week, and we did that because we had a lot of shut-ins and whatnot. But to me, uh, having a program is a more effective tool than simply showing your worship assemblies. I just don't think that that is an outreach that, that helps that people are going to be uh, interested in. Uh, we had two wet dry votes in Marion County or in Hamilton in the last uh, few years, and we used television uh, on both occasions. Uh, Ted Burleson, the preacher at the local uh, church in town in Hamilton, and I worked together uh, on two occasions, uh, actually on two different occasions, more than once each time, but uh, on the wet dry issue, and we did a live program and took questions and calls. Uh, which is always always interesting, and again, our our program 
uh, what does the Bible say has been on since April of 2011. I think uh, if the Lord wills next Thursday, I'll have episode about 173 uh, if everything works out. So we've been on for a long time. And, uh, and, and people will recognize you based on, based on that work, so that's been effective. Uh, the radio work that we're able to do. You know, Ronnie talked about that I came to Burleson just about the time he left Barn Creek, and that's exactly right. And you know how I know that? Because I had to do his radio program for a whole year. He left, and they hired Jamie Long, and Jamie was still a student at Memphis School of Preaching, and Barn Creek had a five-minute daily program, Monday through Friday, and a 30-minute Sunday program. And uh, my mother's first cousin is an elder at that congregation, and they asked, if we want to keep our radio program going, even though Jamie can't do it, will you do it? And I did. I had a key to the building, and I went to Ronnie's old office, and he showed me how to set it up, and I recorded their radio program five day or six days a week. Uh, and carried it to the radio station. And radio is still, uh, can be, a, especially local radio, a very effective means. Uh, so I did that uh, for them. Um, in other areas where I've done radio, um, in 2009, uh, I went down to Montgomery and I broadcast the state softball tournament because our girls were in it. And, uh, and the radio station asked me if I'd go down and, and, and broadcast uh, all the girls' games. And so I went down for a couple of days and I broadcast the games uh, back on local radio. Uh, I've been the radio announcer and the TV announcer. Well, I was a radio and TV announcer for the high school football games for four years. I was the radio announcer last year. Uh, and, uh, and to give you an idea of how uh, that can be a very effective, I know Ronnie did radio. He got in trouble one time probably more than one time, but I know he got in trouble one time because he said something that wasn't real nice about the Hackleburg girls basketball team. And a bunch of the people at Barn Creek went to school, their kids went to school at Hackleburg, and I about remember exactly what he said. Well, he said, if this is the number one 1A girls team in the state of Alabama, there aren't very many good girls teams in the state of Alabama. You remember saying that, Ronnie? Oh, I bet you do. I'm sure Dale Jenkins just cringed every time Ronnie got on the mic, just worried about what Ronnie might say. And, and he, he might have been right on that. But, uh, but you know, I, I remember I remember that, that they were the, they were the radio guys, and, and that's a great way to, to have your name in the, in the community. Uh, but uh, I've been doing the, the football uh, for about five years. Uh, that's led into allowing me to record radio spots for local businesses. And so because my voice is somewhat recognizable, uh, so much so in a civil lawsuit case about two years ago, a guy that used to be my part-time partner on the radio broadcast for the football games was involved. And the lawyers on the other side were trying to get a change of venue because they said of him, he's the voice of the Aggies. And in a court of law, the judge said, I know who the voice of the Aggies is, and he's not it. It's Todd Clifford. <laughs> and so just give you an idea of the influence that you can have in, in just a very, you know, just a very common way. Uh, and so that was even, that's a, a matter of record in a, in a court hearing that I'm the voice of the Aggies and nobody can ever take that away from me, I guess. Um, the newspaper, the newspaper, especially, again, small town local papers. Our paper comes out twice a week, comes out Wednesdays and Saturdays. And there's letters to the editor on Wednesday. And uh, I've used uh, that, uh, letters to the editor. I've used uh, uh, articles in the paper itself. Uh, when you write, uh, and by the way, anybody can do this. This is something that, that anybody can do. But let me, just give you, let me just give you four keys to writing effectively to the editor. All right, number one, and again, speak, this is from a church Christian perspective. Number one, write on social and moral issues. All right, write on social and moral issues. Number two, be judicious in your use of Scripture. All right, an editor is not going to print your letter if it's 90% quotation of Scripture. They're just not going to do it, and people are not going to read it. So be judicious in your use of Scripture. Number three, be accurate in your use of Scripture. Make sure that you're using a proper text to make 
a proper point. Uh, you know, we can misuse text just as, just as easily as the next guy. In fact, uh, you know, there are a number of passages. Uh, I preached an entire series of sermons, about six or seven sermons on Sunday night at Burleson on uh, does it really say that? And what that was was all kinds of verses that we throw around that we take out of context. And we use the verse to teach truth, but the verse itself is not one that ought to be used to teach that particular truth. And so, uh, and so if you're going to do that, make sure that you use your uh, scriptures judiciously and accurately. Because if you use it, if you make a bad argument... Even if you're teaching truth, a bad argument is damaging to the truth, it, it, if somebody, to those that know better. And then lastly, use proper grammar and spelling. The one thing, I've, if I've learned anything from, from Facebook, it is that our educational system is in tatters. Man, you talk about the wor we must be the worst spelling nation on the face of the earth. And I'm not just talking about using the letter U and the letter R for U R. That's that's understandable. I'm just talking about flat out misspelling, using the people don't know the difference between there, there, and there. They don't know the difference between your and your. I mean, they they don't know the difference between sell and sale. It's, it's, um, it's horrific. It's horrific. If you're going to write a letter to the editor, make sure that your spelling and your grammar is proper. Because, again, if you're writing as a Christian, you're representing the church. And we want to represent the church and put it in the very best possible light that we can. So the, news, the newspaper. All right. Uh, uh, number five, benevolence. Benevolence. Uh, for years and years, uh, when I was in uh, Dexter, Missouri, and that's my hometown, a, a great personal evangelist uh, was there. His name was Dale Grissom. And Dale was well known for saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That was his catchphrase of sorts. And, uh, and, so, and it's still true. Benevolence is a great way to get your name into the community. Uh, use community organizations to identify families in need. Uh, if, if the Adamsville Church or wherever it is that you worship is like the Burleson Church, for years and years, our benevolent program has been reactive as opposed to proactive. And by reactive, I mean we sit and we wait for somebody to show up and ask for something. Rather than being proactive and finding someone who is in need. Now, again, I'm blessed to have some contacts in town and live in a small town, but a good friend of mine, who, by the way, is a Baptist preacher, works in a, a, a community action group in town, but it's through his office that we are able to find families in need and help those particular families. And that's what I'm talking about in proactive Benevolence. When you hear about a house fire, somebody from the church be the first one on the scene to, to ask that family, what can we do to help you? Be the first one on the scene with a $50 or $100 Walmart gift card and just hand it to them and say, this is from, we'll just say, this is from the Adamsville Church of Christ. Whatever you need, you know, use this. And when you need something, you know, give them your name and number and then follow up on that. That's proactive benevolence. Uh, where my daughter teaches school in Clarksville, Tennessee. She lives uh, uh, in Middle Tennessee and she teaches school in Clarksville. During the school year, some of our brethren became aware of the fact, and, and we all really have hidden our, our eyes to this, is that there are a lot of kids who don't eat if they don't go to school. I mean, that's just a sad, I mean, and, and it's a shame that America is like that, but it's not America's fault, it's their parents' fault. Because they'd rather spend the money on cigarettes and, 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 and booze and gambling and, and lottery tickets or whatever. And, and they recognize that a lot of kids were not eating from the time they left school on Friday until they came back to school on Monday. Just whatever they might, just, you know, sustenance. 
you know, just, just hand to mouth. And what they did was they identified about 100 of the neediest kids in their community. And every Friday, every Friday, those kids have a backpack. And those kids go to the cafeteria or the gym or wherever it is, and they get their backpack every Friday before they get on the bus to go home. And there are canned goods and basic foodstuffs in that backpack that go home with those kids every single Friday to make sure that they have something to eat between Friday and the next Monday. That's proactive benevolence. And if you don't think people see that, if you don't think people know that that church does that, you'd be sadly mistaken. And so that's another way. Uh, also, youth group projects uh, for your shut-ins, uh, for your uh, folks that uh, can't get out. Is a, is a benevolent act for your own people, but it also helps you to identify other people that might need. For example, if you go, if you take the youth group to, to, uh, to Sister A's house to rake the leaves, and then you realize that Sister A also lives next to a widow lady that needs her leaves raked, you go rake those leaves. Do you think that'll make an impression on, on that person? Do you think she's going to tell anybody? That the kids from the Adamsville Church of Christ came and raked her leaves. Well, sure she is. I mean, that's the best advertising that, that you can get. And so benevolence is a great way to get your name out into the community and youth group projects. We did that very thing when I was in uh, uh, Eastwood Street in Paris, Tennessee, and also in Prescott, Arizona. Our youth group did those kind of projects in the community uh, with a great deal, I think, of effectiveness and at least... Um, giving the church a good name in the community. By the way, I was going to say, number one, the, the easiest way to get, and I, I apologize for leaving this out, the easiest way to get your name out in the community is to get arrested. But I don't suggest it. But that's the easiest way. Now, civic involvement. Civic involvement. And this is the last one I'm going to talk about, and it, it's fairly lengthy. Um, coach youth sports. When my kids played, I coached. When my daughter played, and she didn't play softball, but just a year or two, and then my son got old enough to play, and I coached him until he decided he didn't want to play. But I continued to coach after my son quit playing. And that is a way that people will learn to appreciate you, that you're coaching not just so that you can get your kid on the all-star team, you know, or just so that your kid can be the quarterback or the pitcher or whatever, is that, that shows you have a genuine interest in other people's children and, and their well-being. And so coaching youth sports. Um, one thing I was able to do this last year, uh, we have a little program of flag football. I think it's called Upward. It's an organization, Upward. And, uh, and I speak at the halftime of, both, uh, of those football games. They have a little devotion because it's kind of a, kind of a Bible-oriented type program, and so uh, I speak at the halftime of those, of those particular football games and uh, have been very, very well received uh, by the community uh, in, that, in that respect, and so that's another thing. Uh, civic clubs and organizations are always good. I don't know that they're always as, as effective because it's so common. In other words, you, you kind of get, I mean, you join the Lions Club, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get lost. In other words, it's hard to distinguish yourself in a large civic type organization, but it is something that you can do. Uh, I've been somewhat involved with the local government. Um, a number of occasions I've been asked, and I always do this every time I get, every time I'm asked is, is that I lead the prayer before city council meetings. You know, our city council says the Pledge of Allegiance is called to order. They say the Pledge of Allegiance, and they have a prayer uh, before the council meeting begins. And every time that I am asked to pray at the city council meeting, I do it. And I always dress like this, and nobody else is dressed like this, but I want to represent the church as best I can and let the people know that I'm concerned about what is going on, and I want to represent the Burleson Church as best I possibly can. I always wear a suit and tie uh, to the city council meetings uh, to lead uh, prayers. Uh, school involvement. Th again, this is easy for me. I live in a small town. My wife teaches the sixth grade, uh, teaches sixth grade English, and so this is easy for me. may not be for others, uh, but, but I was the president of the Basketball Booster Club for three years. Uh, I gave that up. It just, it just got to be too much 
too much for me, but uh, I served as uh, the president. I served as vice president for two years. I uh, served as president for three years and continued to serve beyond when my son quit playing basketball. I stayed on uh, as president for two or three years after, after he graduated high school. So again, showing involvement. Uh, also, I've been the public address announcer for, for the basketball games for the last five years. Uh, that, again, people recognize you. Uh, I speak at various youth functions that are associated with the school, including the FCA meetings. Uh, I'm not a big advocate of SCA. I, I, I think there are a number of organizational and doctrinal issues with it, but given the opportunity to, te to talk to young people about the Bible, I'm going to take it. And I always talk about, because it goes from year to year, I teach the kids about the integrity of the Scriptures and the authority of the Bible. Those are the lessons that I just, I just stay right there because I know that they're not getting that probably anywhere else. And so I use those uh, opportunities. I, I volunteer at the school's chaperone for various uh, functions. Uh, the forestry service has a, a couple of outings a year, and I've served as a chaperone uh, for, for those kids. Of course, it's sixth graders, which again makes it easy because my wife teaches sixth grade. And then she volunteers me and then calls me and lets me know when I need to be there. So, uh, but that's, a, 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 I'm active in 4-H. Uh, and again, this is something I do, but anybody that, that you know, has the time can be active in 4-H. Uh, I judge the various county contests. I'm involved with the po uh, getting involved with the uh, poultry uh, aspect of it. Um, they asked me to be the, and I really hated to have to do this, but they said they were going to buy a drone with a high-definition camera attached to it, and they needed somebody to learn how to fly it and demonstrate it at the, at the area schools. And I reluctantly, they say, well, you can keep it at your house and use it all you want. So I reluctantly accepted the responsibility of, of getting the drone, and, and I've already got big plans on using it for turkey hunting. And, uh, because, you know, if you can fly a drone out there and see in live time what's in the field, that saved me a lot of steps. So I kind of had an ulterior motive, but, uh, but uh, work with 4-H and, and, and the various, uh, various projects. I've judged talent shows at the middle school, and, and that's always interesting. Uh, but, uh, but just being involved in various aspects of, of the community and, and civic organizations. I've not done this yet, uh, but, uh, but if you can, be a substitute teacher. You know, our schools need good substitute teachers. You know, my wife, my wife just... You know, she's got about four or five people. You know, there's a big, long list, but there's only about four or five people she really wants to call when she's going to be out of school. And if she doesn't get one of those four or five, she's really discouraged. And my, in fact, my wife started her career as a teacher by substitute teaching. Uh, she's, a, uh, she's an accountant by, by education. She graduated from Freed with a degree in accounting. When our kids were born, she dropped out of, the, out of the workforce so that she could be home with the kids. When the kids started school, she started substitute teaching at their school. So she's always been close to them. And then she loved it so much, she went back to school at night, got her master's in education, and now she's a school teacher. Uh, but uh, we need good substitute teachers. Uh, and that's a great way uh, to, get, uh, to get your name and, 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 and your face and into and make a great impact uh, in your uh, community. Now, having said all of that, having said all of that, I'm going to make one more statement. Not one of these things is necessary to be an effective soul winner. Not one. Of all the things that I've mentioned, and we could have probably mentioned a million more, not one is necessary to be an effective soul winner. And not one of these things in and of themselves will ever win one soul. I'll mention Carl Sims again. To my knowledge, Carl Sims doesn't serve on the PTA. Carl Sims doesn't do announcing it in Clarksville, Tennessee. You know, Carl Sims doesn't do any of these things. doesn't have a radio program, doesn't have a TV program. You know, he, he doesn't do any of these things and yet he still baptizes 200 people every year. So everything that I've talked about today in this session 
is simply a means to open a door to do what I talked about in my previous session, being a more effective personal evangelist. All of these things, house to house, all the civic involvement, all the TV, all the radio, only opens doors of opportunity to allow us to do what God has commissioned us to do. So I must still act. I must still teach. So again, you say, well, I can't do any of these things. Not necessary. Not necessary to do these things. So, but a lot, of, a lot of ways, these are just some ways that, that, that in the last, I'm in my, as Ronnie said, I'm in my 20th year uh, at Burleson. It's only preaching, uh, it's only pulpit I've ever held. I hope it's the only one that I ever hold. I hope it's only, my, I hope my first preaching gig is my last. Uh, but these are just some things that I've been blessed to do uh, because of my tenure and because of the work that my wife does and, and other things uh, that's allowed me to, to have my name in, in the community. And, and so hopefully these things will be helpful to you. Um, Ronnie.